Uh, welcome. Welcome to this session. We are very happy to have you here. Um, we are not sure why you have picked this out of the many good presentations that are going on, uh, but anyways, we are, we are happy to, to see you. So we have titled this presentation, um, Is there room for improving Kubernetes SPA? And you may notice there is a question mark at the end, and the reason for that question mark is because we, we don't know. <laughs> So basically, um, we, we are not experts on, on HPA, okay? <laughs> we, we are people, the three of us, uh, we have an academic background. Uh, so basically, we have been, you know, uh, thinking about HPA, thinking with it, uh, doing some experiments, and the, the goal here is hopefully to, to spark some, some discussion and, and have some conversation with you, with you after the, the session. So a bit more, a bit more about the, the three of us. Um, today on the stage, you have uh, Berta. Uh, she's a PhD student at, at Barcelona Tech. You have uh, Gabor there. He's the, the CTO for uh, L7MP.io, and he's also a, a professor at BMU University. And I'm Alberto. I'm a tech lead at Cisco, and I work at the enterprise CTO team there. So before we go into the, you know, the core of the presentation, we thought it could be interesting to, to describe you know, where we are coming from, which work we have done in the past, what has motivated us to do this presentation, so that we are all in the same page of you know, why we are all here together today. So let's start slow, auto-scaling. <laughs> auto-scaling, the, the idea is, is simple enough. You have some, some load that goes up, some, some replicas that, that goes up as well. And, and the three of us, and together with some people from you know, our, our institutions, we were thinking on, on auto scaling. And, and we have been thinking about scaling for, for some time. And one of the things that we were thinking about is okay, what really means that you auto scale things? So, one implication of that is that you are consuming some resources on your system. And typically, people tend to think of these resources in terms of CPU and memory. But one thing that we realized on some time ago is that another resource that is typically consumed and sometimes goes unnoticed is, is the network. So we ask ourselves the question, is there any relationship between auto-scaling and the network? Of course, there is some, some relationship, right? So the, the idea, again, is, is still simple. You have more replicas, you have more traffic. You have more traffic, you have more replicas. So as the you know, uh, request went into your system, you have to scale up the, the microservice. Uh, scaling the microservice up means that that microservice may generate more traffic going on. So we did some work uh, following that uh, train of thought. And, and we eventually end up with, with some designs that were able to, to take into account the number of replicas to then decide how you want to manage the, the network infrastructure. Basically, uh, with that, we were able to you know, uh, reduce the amount of uh, guesswork that we had to do on the network side and be more efficient in the, in the use of, of resources. If you're interested in that work, uh, Berta here wrote a very nice paper uh, that, that we published at uh, uh, one sitcom workshop. You have the reference there if you want to, to read the details and you can come ask us. So for some time, we were very happy with, with this, and, and we were happy with the, with the results we achieved. And then after a while, we keep thinking on, on auto-scaling, and, and we realized that you know, we have not really scratched the surface, because typically, you don't have a single service. You have something like this. This is the canonical example, book info application from Istio, that you have seen in half of the presentations around QFCon. <laughs> So basically, this is here to show that typically you have a, a microservice graph. So one service calling another service that then calls another service, and you know this can go on and on. So what are the implications of, of this from an auto scaling perspective? The the idea is, is the same, right? So you have more more traffic that goes in, you scale up, that generates more traffic that goes to another service, and then needs to scale up and so on. But the dynamics are a bit more complicated because you have now multiple pieces that kind of you know, interact. So at that point, we, we ask ourselves, we, we like to ask ourselves many questions, as you can see. We ask ourselves another question that is, um, what really drives uh, auto-scaling and, and the dynamics of this uh, microservice graph auto-scaling? 
And as you can imagine, because it is in the title of the presentation, the answer is, of course, HPI. So what this presentation is going to be about is really about microservice graphs, HPA, and how the two relate with one another. Um, before we go deep into that, just in case that someone is here from the previous presentation or, or they just were looking for an empty stop, a spot, just one, one, one slide on HPA, okay? <laughs> so, so what is HPA? Basically, uh, three, three points, uh, three things that compose basically the, the way HPA works. So one thing is that you need to declare your workload with certain resource requests. For instance, in this example, we are showing a, an example with a, a request of 200 uh, millicores CPU. The second thing you need is that you need to declare an, an HPA with certain resource thresholds. And, and we are using an example here that is, uh, you know, you want to have the number of replicas between 1 and 10. And you are targeting having an average CPU utilization of 80%, more or less. right? And the third thing that you know makes the magic happen is having this HPA controller that is monitoring the target metric, and then depending on how it sees things, it brings the number of replicas up or down to try to stay within the, the thresholds defined. And you will see through the presentation that we use typically CPU as the metric that we are targeting. But really, uh, there are other metrics you can target as well, but you know, we use a CPU for, for simplicity and we stick with that through the presentation. So that's the intro. We get that out of the way, and we can focus now in the, the cool stuff. So as I said, this presentation is going to be about microservice graphs. We're going to take a look at what happens when they auto-scale and why they behave the way they behave when they auto-scale. And then finally, we're going to get to the question, can we, can we do better there? And, and we hope that you know, we can get some, some feedback from, from you people on, on if that is an option or not. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Berta that she's going to talk about what the heck is going on with microservice graphs. Uh, thanks, Alberto. So after we've got the background on HPA uh, out of our way, uh, as he said, we're now going to see what happens with uh, a whole application with different microservices connected. We're still going to keep on using the booking for uh, application as an example. So everybody knows what we're talking about. And a microservice application, in the end, it's just a connection of multiple services back-to-back. Uh, -back. So uh, an important thing to notice is that the output of one service is just the input of the next one. And that's the case for uh, all the services. So if we take a look at the product page, the output of that service is the input to the review service. And the output of the review service is, in turn, the input for the ratings microservice. And uh, although these are connected, each of uh, the services has its own HPA and it scales independently. So all these resources are managed by their own HPA. And we're going to see uh, what happens when there's a sudden increase of load at the beginning of this microservice application. So the first service uh, suddenly gets an increase of requests. And we'll do so with a thought experiment that will just go together th uh, step by step to see what happens. So imagine that we have uh, this three service chain um, where each microservice has, um, for starters, uh, just one pod or replica, which is the gray square uh, circle, sorry. And each of the microservice is able to process one green square of requests. So uh, if it just gets one green square of requests, everything's fine, uh, the traffic flows and there's no losses, uh, whatever. And we're going to check what happens when uh, an increase of requests that we were not expecting, which is the yellow square, comes to the beginning of uh, the input of the first service. And we're going to check three different metrics um, for each of the different microservices. So the first one that we're going to get, it's kind of obvious, is the request rate and to see how it goes up. And the second one is the number of replicas that each pod has, uh, each microservice has deployed, which is also the number of pods, uh, which is driven by the HPA. And finally, we are going to check uh, the number of failed requests that uh, each microservice has, has in each point in time. So if we see what happens when the um, yellow square, which is the increase of requests, reaches the input of the first microservice in the chain, um, you can see on the first plot on the first row that we have this in, uh, increase in request rate, which in turn um, also increases the CPU utilization because the microservice is struggling to deal with this added load. And 
after some time, when the CPU has reached a uh, high level enough, it triggers the HPA threshold, so it goes over and then HPA notices that it needs more resources. So it sends the event autoscaling signal to start deploying a new replica. And what is important to see here is this yellow line, which highlights the time between the request rate starts going up and the actual uh, new replica is ready and able to serve these requests. So between those times, um, if we have a container with uh, limited uh, resources, like very tight uh, limits and requests, we can see some failed requests going up since uh, we don't have enough uh, CPU power to just deal with all the load that we're getting. So if we take a look after a while, um, this new replica will be deployed. So now you see on the first service, now it has two replicas. So it is able to process the two squares of load. So now they are both green. And, in t and at the same time, the number of failures and the, the request, the failure request goes down because everything goes back to normal and uh, it stabilizes. But what happens is now that that amount of load is uh, passed and cascades to the second microservice. So it faces a very similar situation. Uh, as the first microservice. So it gets uh, the in this increase of load, this, its CPU goes up, and then it triggers the HPA um, event autoscaling again. And well, after some, uh, some time, the replica gets deployed, and you guessed it, there's a little bit of time in between where the failed requests go up, and when it stabilizes, it goes down again. And well, mm, nothing very different for the third one. So it gets an increase of request, the CPU goes up, the HPA triggers an event for autoscaling, and some requests are being failed while we are waiting for the new replica to be, to be ready. And well, after a while, all the three microservices have their own replicas ready uh, to go and serve this request. So this, the system goes back to its initial state of being able to process everything that it's getting. But we have, we have had these three critical uh, time spots that are highlighted in, in yellow that show that we have um, some small problems in, in the middle. And well, this as a thought experiment was really nice, but we thought, come on, we really need to check on a deployment if that's really the case of what's happening or not. So we went and implemented the same um, three microservice chain to see if what we had the intuition that was going to happen um, really did happen. So we did the same uh, one service after the other. So we have three connected services. And we checked for the same three metrics, which is the uh, load or the CPU uh, average utilization. Then we will see that we have the number of replicas for each microservice. And finally, the number of failed requests. So if we check at this first plot, you see that the green line, which corresponds to the first microservice in the chain, is the first one that gets the, this increase of requests that Oh, I forgot to mention, for this test, uh, we have a uh, ramping up load for the first minute, and then the load is just stable until uh, the end of the 15 minutes test. So what you see here on the green line is this uh, increase of load during the first uh, minute, and then uh, the stabilization. So um, what you see is the difference between the three lines, this spacing is the time that the information or the traffic um, takes it to go from the first service to, so that we scale up the first service to the second service and the time that this takes to scale up and then to the third one. And this is also what we see on the number of replicas by microservice, this uh, shift in time uh, from the first one to the second one to the third one. So if we take a look at the green line again for the first microservice, you see that there's a point when there are two replicas deployed uh, for that, but for the second and the third one, the yellow and the blue line, there's still only one replica. So the first one is able to process, to process the double amount of traffic that the second one and the third uh, one are able to process. And that's what gets us to the third plot. So in this third plot, we see the, um, the HTTP error rate for the second microservice and the third microservice. Um, so for example, the green line here shows the request rate that the review service has reported by its parent microservice, that is the one that comes before in the chain. Uh, because since they are errors, they cannot report it themselves that they have failed. And similarly, with the yellow line, it shows the similar thing, the, the error that the rating service has had because it has not been able to scale as fast as it would require. So with that, we can just take a step back and look at the big picture again. And, we, and it's just like um, every time that you have an auto-scaling event, there's this uh, delay between the HPA trigger 
uh, happens until the new replica is actually ready to serve these requests. When we have uh, a critical time where there's potential uh, request failures, and if we look at the whole application graph and you just add up all these traffic losses, you end up with this green line here, which is the total traffic uh, request rate failure for the application. And then we asked ourselves, how, how can we just improve this line so we don't have traffic failure? And it's a tough balance between uh, actually having traffic loss because you've defined your, um, your resources with very few margins or actually over provisioning and saying, okay, you can just set very low thresholds, but then you're wasting resources and in turn money. So uh, now Gabor will go on on why is this happening actually. Thank you, Bert. Stop for a moment and try to understand what's happening here in this situation. Think about the book info application. This application actually consists of three microservices, the product page, the review, and the ratings microservices. The product page has, to, has enough resources to generate a landing page for a user request. Then it actually makes a call to the review service so that the review service supplies uh, the user reviews per book uh, for the product page to be included in the user response. And the, uh, the review service, in turn, makes a call out to the rating service uh, to generate the ratings uh, uh, per book uh, uh, that we can also include in the response. Each of the three microservices in this situation must have enough resources provision for us to be able to return a meaningful and useful response to the user. Any of the resources fail, there is a failed user request, or the user request will be delayed beyond timeout, and this will lead to a bad user experience. So ideally, ideally for such microservice applications, we want each of them of the services to start scaling at exactly the same time. So that at every instance of time, each of the three microservices have enough resources to be able to provide or to be able to serve uh, the elevated user request level. But this is not what we are seeing here. Instead, we are seeing something different. Each of the microservices in this little service chain uh, 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 starts the scaling uh, uh, sequentially one after the other, so instead of scaling. At the same time, we see this delayed response uh, and delayed signal propagation along this, service, uh, along this service chain. The deeper the service graph, the more services to be chained one, uh, one after the other in this situation, the higher the traffic loss and the higher or the worse the over or the under provisioning, this transient where, we, where some of the microservices in the chain do not run with enough resources to serve the elevated request level. If we actually look at this system, look at the situation, we see that there is a deep architectural reason behind this phenomenon. Okay. The situation is that the whole microservice graph is not driven by a single HPA control loop. Rather, we have a single independent HPA control loop uh, a provision for each of the microservices separately, and these three HPA control loops work in complete isolation. One of the one, uh, uh, from the other. So these, each of these three microservices or these HPA control loops work on purely local information and we need time uh, to get the news from the product page to the review page that the scaling is in progress and again we need more time to get the news uh, to the rating service. So what would a normal and sane person do in this situation? They would just go out and implement something that would just remedy the situation for us. We are not normal people. We are academics. Deep down in our souls, we are scientists. Scientists work in strange and unexpected ways. For, for the first thing that they do in such a situation is to create an analytical model. This is where we feel at home. So wherever you have formulas, Wherever there is mathematics involved, we feel familiar. This is because then we have a working model, we believe that we, we convince ourselves that we have a deep understanding of what's going on in a situation. There is a beautiful piece of engineering science, control theory, which is dedicated exactly 
to understand such situations, such control loops. We are interested in the dynamics of this system, so how the system behaves in time, and for this, control theory is the right theory that can be applied to actually answer such questions. To apply and to cast this system in the framework of control theory, we need two analytical models, two dynamic models. One for the application that describes the application's response in time to elevated uh, request levels, and one other for the controller. The application, it's actually the thingy that we are actually controlling in a control theoretical setting, is called the plant in this fancy control theoretical terminology. We're actually going to use this terminology here. So let's look at the plant. The plant has two inputs. One is the instantaneous HTTP request level, QK, which is imposed on the system uh, 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 at uh, 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 time K. And we imagine that there is this hypothetical function A that will convert this QK signal into an actual CPU consumption at time step K. This amount divided by the amount of CPU provisioned by Kubernetes provision by HPA to this microservice, uh, the ratio of the two will, will generate the average, CPU risk, uh, uh, the average CPU consumption of our microservice at timestamp k plus 1. We take this output and we plug this into the controller. So the other component here is the control load. It's basically just a, a reformulation of the control load that we program the deep into the HPA controller. These two, two systems, when plugged into a, a, a feedback control loop, will provide us with the, uh, the, with the required dynamics. On the, on the surface, this is a perfectly well-behaved dynamical and discrete time control system, so that's good. The bad news is that this is highly nonlinear. So if you look at the plan and you look at the control, uh, the control loop, both are nonlinear functions of their input. This is bad. If you are familiar with control theory, you know that as long as the system is linear, you are on the same ground, but as soon as it gets non-linear, we are basically out there on our own. Still, we've been able to show that the system is stable. All control theorists worry about stability. Self-stability or, in control theoretical terms, global asymptotic uh, stability in this sense means uh, that this control, low, uh, th th this control uh, uh, loop alone will actually reach the required reference CPU uh, uh, level uh, at uh, uh, some finite uh, uh, number of time steps, irrespectively of the level of user input and irrespectively of the initial state where the system starts. From. So that's the good news, and that new, uh, this is thanks to Bert. <laughs> beautiful. Okay. The bad news, however, is that when we plug these control uh, uh, loops into a microservice system, so the first system generates the output for the second, things can really go wrong. Okay. At the moment, we don't have such stability proof for this system, and we know about very, very mm, pathological examples where things can, can go really wrong. So one pathological example is where the microservice graph has positive feedback, uh, a directed cycle of microservices call, calling one after the other in a directed cycle in such situations, uh, the system can oscillate or it can even produce this runaway scaling. So what we mean by that is that the microservice A making the call to microservice B and then B calling C at a certain point in time, but still within the context of servicing the same user request, microservice C making a call back uh, to microservice A. At the moment, we postulate that such a thing can only happen by mistake. So if you know in practice, in your own practice, that you've ever seen such a situation, A calling B, B calling C, C calling back A, if such a situation you've ever experienced in, in any of your then please come and talk to us because we are really, really curious of your input. The other good thing about analytical models is that we plug them into sim uh, simulation. So this is what we did. We can actually get insight into the running system without actually having to deploy it other in production. So what we did here is to plug the system into MATLAB and see uh, 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 whether or not the diagrams or the plots that we get are similar to the ones we've seen before. And now we actually get, get uh, 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 
we confirm that, 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 the, that the system behaves as expected. On the left side, you see this delayed CPU response from the CPU mic uh, from the different microservices, and on the right, you can see that the, uh, the uh, HTTP failure rate is very similar to the one we've seen earlier. <coughs> so what next? First, let's try to understand where we are at this point. Uh, the first thing to know, rest assured that there is a very, very good chance that if you switch HPA on, on your workload, it will behave uh, as expected. We see that we have to do very nasty things for HPA to go wrong. Perhaps your microservice graph is not that deep. Perhaps not all your microservices are uh, constrained on the same resource or constrained at all. For instance, perhaps you have databases uh, are deep down in the service graph that need no scaling at all. In such situations, HP will do what you want it to do because the control load that's built into HPA is extremely robust. Its simplicity is both its elegance and its biggest drawback. Because sometimes you see weird artifacts when these independent control loops act together in weird and unexpected ways and for this to be able to avoid such artifacts you will need to have a very good understanding So what next? Of course, we, uh, we can do something about this, we can implement something, deploy something that will make uh, the scaling process faster. One idea is to drive um, the, the HPA control loop, which is at the moment completely local and doesn't have microservice graph level insight uh, uh, from, a, from maybe a more clever or a more compound signal. So we can actually, for instance, plug the CPU consumption at the earlier microservices, the parent and the grandparent of microservices forward uh, into our control loop and drive HPA from a compound or an aggregated uh, uh, resource usage metric. This thing might have a chance to speed up the process. And the good news is that uh, when we actually plug this idea into our analytical system, we see significant speed up. So what we see here is that the blue plot is the, uh, is the CPU consumption and, and the last microservice, the ratings microservice without our modifications, and the purple line is with our modifications. You can see significant speed up, at least in this very example, in the analytical model, we could completely remove uh, uh, the scaling delay and make uh, auto-scaling instantaneous across the entire uh, service. Of course, we can also uh, uh, implement something which has omnipotent uh, and uh, 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 understanding of the whole microservice graph and produces some optical driver uh, uh, for the HPA control loop. At the moment, we don't know how to do that. This is also a distinct possibility. So what's next for us? We will, of course, play with these ideas, come up with different models, compound uh, 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 scaling signals, play with them and try to implement at least one or two ideas. It seems that Keller would be a perfect example to do that, but we've, uh, we've also experienced with the SIG auto scaling balancer resource. It seems like a perfect tool to actually just try these ideas out. Balancer is also something which uses input from multiple uh, uh, different services different deployments to drive the HPA control loop. Our use case is very similar to Balancer. It's just the way we actually produce the compound signal is different. And of course, we want to, uh, uh, to go back to the original network-based scaling idea. And of course, we want to have more theoretical proofs. But before doing anything uh, uh, on this front, we need your input. We need your comments because we need to know the types of situations that we see in production uh, uh, whether or if so, if you have uh, an example where HPA behave as you expected or actually misbehave, please come talk to us because we need you. And of course, don't forget that we are hiring for PhD positions. Thank you, and we are open.